Hello and welcome to Shaka Extra Time. Uh, Shaka is here live today. And uh, a warm welcome to all our Facebook followers are watching us uh, live on Facebook. Uh, before we start, uh, hello, Shaka. Hello, Paul. How are you? Hugely terrific, of course, uh, to be in the second week, my friend, of a new year. Uh, interesting, interesting. Uh, this new year uh, seems uh, to be starting on a very good uh, uh, spot, uh, but uh, uh, in uh, some places in Africa, uh, there are a lot of uh, contentious uh, issues. Let's go maybe to Kenya. Mm -hmm. uh, things haven't been that good in Kenya. Yes, we have a new government in place, uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta and uh, his deputy, uh, uh, Ruto, William Ruto, were sworn in, but uh, the political dust hasn't settled. Uh, Raila is still making noise here and there. He's saying that uh, he's going to be sown in uh, on uh, the 30th of January. Uh, a lot of people are talking about it. Uh, but uh, personally, I think uh, this is an unstarter. Your thoughts? I don't know why you call it an unstarter because obviously the last time I checked, uh, you and I are not prophets. So there's I no way. I didn't claim I was a prophet, Shaka. There's no way we can possibly read the future. I think that our role is observers and monitors. And we basically have to listen to what some of those people who are making news, um, what, are they, what they are saying, and whether, in fact, at the end of the day, uh, whether they can translate their rhetoric into action or practice. So I think that the jury is still out. I have heard, of course, and uh, read that uh, Raira expects to be sworn in as uh, the people's president, uh, as you correctly said, uh, on January 30th. We don't know whether that is going to happen or not happen, but it is also conditional, mind you, because they're also hoping that um, there will be a very significant dialogue between uh, the ruling party Jubilee, led, of course, by President uh, Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta. So, Let's wait and see, because let's face it, um, it even doesn't look good, in fact, uh, uh, in Jubilee territory, because there seems to be, in fact, a split between Uhuru Kenyatta and the Deputy President, William Ruto, in terms of the appointing of a new cabinet. Uh, well, uh, Shaka, how, what do you make of this uh, argument? There are a lot of people out there who say that, uh, uh, for example, Raila Odinga was given a chance uh, to participate in uh, the elections that preceded the one that was annulled by the Supreme Court. But uh, he overplayed his hand, or uh, I would use maybe a sports analogy. Uh, he played the wrong hand and things didn't work out. So in my view, he committed political suicide. He should have actually gone for it and maybe seen what would have happened. I don't know that um, I can really reach the same conclusion as you because um, I look at the facts and they seem to tell me something different. It is true that uh, you had a chance, especially given the, uh, was it December, the September 1st uh, uh, Supreme Court ruling, which annulled the uh, August 8th election, uh, and there was supposed to be uh, a repeat election within 60 days. The problem here, my brother, is that uh, the IEBC which obviously was implicated in rigging the election or mishandling the election, was the same institution that was going to carry out precisely the same exercise with absolutely no change. The Supreme Court, for example, ordered the IBC to make sure that the server, the server which contained the results of the August 8th election, to be opened, to be available, to be accessed by NASA agents, uh, to be accessed by uh, uh, the Supreme Court agents and what have you. And guess what? Up to today, up to today, the server has not been made available to those parties, which means, frankly, the Supreme Court should have, in fact, found the IEBC in contempt of court. It never did that. And of course, you know how President Kenyatta reacted uh, upon hearing that uh, his election had actually been annulled. You know how he talked about uh, these wakora, these thugs that are supposed to be judges and all that kind of stuff, and that uh, when he gets uh, another chance, he will fix them. 
And you know what happened uh, just a day, I think, before uh, the repeat election of October 26. You know that uh, the driver slash bodyguard of the deputy chief justice of the Kenyan Supreme Court was actually shot. You also know that the deputy chief justice was actually detained at a house in Karen. She was also, uh, in fact, her telephone had been taken away and what have you. She couldn't communicate. And you know that uh, the chief justice uh, tried to come and uh, have what you'd call uh, a column. He couldn't, he couldn't actually get a column of at least five judges. He ended up having, in fact, himself and another person. And you know, the rest is history. So you're not talking here about an environment, frankly, that even allowed the almighty Supreme Court to conduct its business the way it should, because it is supposed to be part of an independent branch of government that has equal powers with the executive and with the legislature. It didn't happen. Uh, but how about uh, people who argue, for example, and say that, uh, that uh, the optics looked good for Raila? Uh, the fact that uh, the, he had managed to get the Supreme Court to annul that election, things were looking good for him. He had the political upper hand in that election. The appearances. Yes. The appearances, but the IEBC remained subordinate to the chief executive. And as a matter of fact, the key guy, Ezra Chiroba himself, who was the CEO of the, you know, of the, in fact, of that body, you remember he was still part of the group. This is a man who disregarded whatever, in fact, instructions he was even receiving, reportedly, from the chairman of the IEBC, Mr. Chebukati. So let's face it, Mr. Chiroba and the three other commissioners used to apparently report to State House. They would get instructions from there. And in fact, they would just go back and do exactly the bidding of the chief executive. So let's face it, nothing really changed. You wanted simply for Raira Odinga essentially to accompany Uhuru Kenyatta, rather than in fact Uhuru Kenyatta perhaps ending up in fact having a contest between Uhuru and Kenyatta, which seemed to have happened on October 26. Uh, I beg to differ because uh, from the look of things, it looks like, uh, uh, in my view, again, Raila overplayed his hand. He thought by calling on his supporters not to go and participate in the election, he would actually win. Uh, but it turned out uh, that was uh, a big uh, political failure on his part. I don't know where you get that really because let's face it, in fact... They're the both people, my friends. In, I, fact, yeah. in fact, forget about even friendship. The fact of the matter is that... Uh, the people that did not vote actually won. How? Because let's face it, How? there is incontrovertible evidence that you did not have more than 3.5 million people who actually went to vote. And the results took like almost a week in order for people to come up with some kind of figure, which means they were doctoring results and what have you, and eventually they simply doubled that particular number. But let's face it, how come this man won the election on October 26? And we are now in the second week of January 2018. He has no cabinet. Do you know why? Because he clearly knows that he has no legitimacy. It is one thing to be legal. It is another thing to be legitimate. Because you, while you may force someone to do certain things legally, by using the means of coercion, like the police, the intelligence, and what have you, unfortunately, there is nothing you can do to force somebody to essentially look at you legitimately. You cannot f force someone to actually love you. You cannot force somebody to look at you as a legitimate leader of his choice. Uh, but Raila is trying to uh, he's trying to use the same uh, game here. He's trying to uh, have himself uh, sewn in uh, at the end of the month. Uh, my brother. Uh, uh, I don't see a scenario where he's going to actually succeed. My uh, brother. Because uh, take, for example, what happened in Uganda. Uh, the opposition leader in Uganda, uh, Dr. Chiza Resige, uh, right after the election, uh, he was sewn in as uh, uh, another president. But what has that done for him? And in the hearts of a lot of people, by the way, he is their president. 
I have run into people who actually told me in Kampala, the Ugandan capital, that their president is just a message. You see, again, you have to, you have to accept the fact <coughs> that there's a difference between legality and legitimacy. And legitimacy, again, as I said, is not something you can force somebody down the throat. You can't force legitimacy. You can't force anybody to respect you. That one has come outside, you know, within, you know, themselves and what have you, based on uh, their beliefs and what have you. So let's face it, uh, politics is a very interesting game, but you have to know also that uh, society is not static. It is dynamic. And that is why, in fact, when it comes to politics, anybody who knows anything about politics will tell you there are no permanent friends or permanent adversaries in politics. They are merely permanent interests. And whenever the interests actually change, the alliances also keep shifting. And as we talk today, there is no doubt in my mind from what I have read, from what I see, from what I hear, that part of the reason why Kenyatta after today does not have a cabinet in place is precisely because He's looking for ways and means of reaching out mm. to some of Raida's colleagues so that he can, one, undermine him politically, and two, get that thing that is elusive right now, legitimacy. Mm. Because the country is divided. The mood is not a normal situation, my brother. Yeah, Shaka, let's go to an interesting comment here from uh, Shadri Kabyala Dembe. Shaka, you are forgetting that many people voted not because they were intimidated by Raila's group. The IBEC took equipment that and destroyed it. I beg your pardon? Uh, he's saying that uh, you are forgetting that many people voted not because they were intimidated by Raila's group, right? Because Raila's group also intimidated I people. I don't really understand the question because you can't say many people voted S S no, no. He's suggesting that a lot of people turned out to mm -hmm. vote mm -hmm. uh, despite the fact uh, that they were intimidated by Raila's group. Oh, there were very many, as I said, 3.5 million people. Yeah, but he's discounting that. No, he doesn't have the evidence. Where is the evidence? Uh, do you have evidence? Of course I do have the evidence. <laughs> what I am saying is a reflection of the evidence that, in fact, is in the public arena. It is in the public arena. He should go actually and check his record himself. Okay. Let's, okay. Let's go to another uh, comment. Let's go to uh, uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, this is an uh, uh, unusual question from uh, Frank Nwamanya. Uh, he says, "What role do artists uh, uh, like musicians, uh, poets, actors, and others uh, play in uh, the management uh, of our societies, and how significant are they in Africa?" Uh, he, uh, he also gives an example of uh, uh, during the apartheid era, we had the likes of Amelia uh, Makeba, uh, Huma Sekela, who played a very significant role. Uh, even in uh, West Africa, we had like Salif Keita. Uh, those people played a significant role in uh, changing the politics of uh, their countries. Uh, your thoughts, Shaka? To add to that, in fact, uh, those two very uh, important artists that you mentioned, uh, uh, Miriam Makeba and Huma Sekela, who actually happens to be a friend and uh, I haven't talked to him for a very long time, but I remember last time when I had uh, uh, a one-on-one -on, -one, uh, on uh, Straight Talk Africa Live from Johannesburg. Um, they had friends also in the international community. We're talking about Simon and Garfunkel, mm. the American great artists uh, who actually came in to support them. Mm. Um, you could also take it uh, to Nigeria, where you had uh, people like uh, uh, Femi, Femi and Akuri yeah. Kuti, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. The great, uh, yeah. Precisely. Mm. Um, in Uganda, you have um, a one man called Bobby Wine. Uh, these are obviously uh, doing exactly what artists are expected to do, which is providing a voice to the voiceless, mm. not massaging the egos of the status quo. Because there is such a thing as artists actually playing a role of being agents of social change. Agents of social change, uh, because they are supposed to be narrators of society, like spokespeople of society, uh, rather than playing a role of uh, agents of social control. Mm. Uh, you see, again, as I said, uh, 
massaging uh, the egos of dictators uh, over the status quo, um, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's very unfortunate that in a country like Uganda, honestly, uh, the majority of the well-known musicians are not doing precisely what they are expected to do, which is to actually become agents of social change, as opposed to playing the role of agents of social control. You only have Bobby Wine. Uh, well, one could argue that uh, m musicians express uh, themselves in whichever way they want. Uh, uh, what's wrong with uh, them expressing views that favor the government? Yeah, but you know what? At the end of the day, who is the government? The people. The sovereign remains with the people. And the musicians are supposed to be essentially narrators, spokespeople of the people, not an institution as a government. And especially if that particular institution lacks democratic credentials. You're talking about a despotic type of institution, really. And this, some of these guests, you know, these uh, musicians that you are talking about, actually, you know, they receive money from the government in order to support it, in order to become like their, the cheerleaders, really, or cheer singers of the government, for that matter, to such an extent that at one time, some of them even helped you wear your seventy actually to become like a, uh, a rap, a rap star, and all that kind of stuff. You remember that? Mm -hmm. uh, so so uh, w the debate is generating uh, a lot of uh, interest. Uh, they want us uh, to go back and talk about uh, uh, this uh, specification. Is uh, from uh, uh, Muzi uh, Limi, a uh, storyteller. He says, "Shaka, uh, do you think Malim Saif should have done the same?" Uh, as Odinga is threatening to do, to swear in as the people's president in, uh, uh, in Tanzania. I beg your pardon? Malim Saif. Uh, uh, Malim Saif. Saif Sharif Hamadi of yes, Zanzibar. of Zanzibar. Oh, yeah, he, yeah, he probably should have uh, if he had a way to do it. Because let's face it, uh, there's no question in any reasonable person's mind that Saif Sharif Hamadi actually has won the last elections running away in Zanzibar, but this time he wins. CCM, Chukua Chako Mapema, declares victory. Mm. And sometimes it's very embarrassing because they actually have to deploy, to deploy openly soldiers from the Tanzania People's Defense Force to sustain that kind of declaration. Uh, let's go to another uh, Facebook uh, comment. Uh, let's go to uh, uh, Telma Latungu wants to know uh, if uh, Africa is truly in uh, the right uh, direction with the imposed uh, democracy on them. What's uh, your opinion on governance uh, by monarchs? You know, first of all, the first part of the question, frankly, implies that uh, there is a democracy uh, in most of Africa, which is not true. I don't think that uh, you can actually get more than 15 countries out of 55 member countries of the African Union which sincerely display at least some fundamentals or the basics that make up what you would consider to be democracy. Mm -hmm. Now, when you talk about democracy, I think you would be talking about fairness. I don't think, frankly, you should expect uh, anybody from another culture uh, to export fairness to you. We're talking about justice. When you talk about justice, this, these are universal values. There are certain values that are universal, uh, that um, obtain anywhere where there are human beings. Mm. Uh, so I think that uh, it is not the type, for example, of what a former Tanzanian president, Benjamin Mukapa, used to call the Coca-Cola type of democracy. No. There are certain values that are universal. Yeah. Uh, let's and then when you talk about monarchy, um, let's face it, uh, if you talk about a monarchy uh, by pre pretty much really uh, by definition, a monarchy is a dictatorship. But it's a dictatorship that uh, uh, has been in place for a very long time and has had uh, the benefit, for example, of socialization. Uh, which comes through uh, educational curriculum and what have you. And people from the time they are young, they are being told that this is the man or this is the queen. But there are also some monarchies which have since been transformed into constitutional monarchs, like the United Kingdom, for mm -hmm. example. 
you do have uh, a monarchy which is largely symbolic, but in fact, in terms of the governance of society and what have you, you're talking about democracy. Mm. But then you could also look in Africa, you have two probably remaining absolute monarchs. You have Swaziland, uh, where you can't even pretend to have an election, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and then you have uh, uh, Morocco. Uh, Morocco is something in between because, uh, yes, it is a monarchy, but it also allows some very specific democratic uh, institutions to function. And there is no question that uh, there is a semblance of democracy in the kingdom of Morocco. Uh, let's move along. Uh, let's go to Shamahel Kakoma in uh, Zambia. Uh, he wants to know, uh, what do you think? Uh, do you think that uh, we have more dictators in Africa than any other continent? If so, why? I honestly, first of all, uh, don't know. Um, I need to do my homework in order to perhaps be in a position to answer that question very accurately. But uh, if I could uh, uh, make some kind of... Uh, uh, guessment, you know, so to speak, it would seem to me that um, right now we seem to be competing at least against the Middle East. Mm. Uh, and if you look at the countries in the Middle East, uh, they are not as many as the countries in Africa. So it's quite possible that uh, uh, we do have more uh, dictators on the African continent. And the question as to why, I think it is really very simple. I think part of the problem is that uh, uh, we do have a population that is not socially and politically conscious. Uh, and part of the reason, obviously, is because uh, there has not really been uh, a government or institutions that promote, I think, the idea of civic education mm. so that people can know exactly what their rights are and so that they can legitimately assert them. Now. You may say, of course, that, uh, you know, there are radio stations, there are television stations, newspapers, and what have you. People should be able to read and write. But let's face it, in a lot of African countries, people do not have those type of skills of reading or listening mm. and later on making interpretations, analysis, and what have you, and figuring out what is in their best interest. Mm. So I think Africa needs, for example, uh, a free press, free media. It also needs a government, or at least uh, uh, civic society organizations, which can, um, you know, begin to promote this idea of civic education so that people can begin to know their rights, to know that they are actually citizens who have inalienable rights and that they owe allegiance to the state, which is made up of them, rather than, in fact, owing allegiance to an individual authority who is like a presidential monarch, a dictator, uh, a king, a queen, or that kind of stuff, and they do not have, uh, subjects do not have rights, they have privileges, which, by the way, are granted to them in return, in return, by those individual um, leaders, or rulers, in fact, perhaps even more accurately, who run the affairs of the state in those particular countries where there are no citizens but subjects. But uh, of course, uh, you may also say, let's face it, there have been situations where there is a semblance of democracy, and therefore people have all the appearances of institutions that uh, reflect democratic uh, societies. But yet, some of these strong men, where there are no strong institutions, mm -hmm succeed in transforming their citizens, really, into the role or playing the role of subjects, subject to them. Uh, are you at liberty? Uh, there is a Facebook comment here that uh, uh, wants you to either to say whether at liberty to name some of those dictators uh, that uh, you're talking about. It's very simple. The first one, in fact, uh, is a man called uh, Theodore Obiang Basongo of Equatorial Guinea. The second one is Paul Obia of Cameroon. The third one is Yoweri Museveni of Uganda. And the fourth could be Al-Bashir of Sudan, Sarvakir of South Sudan. You could talk about Paul Kagame of Rwanda. You could talk, there are so many across the continent. In fact, there are more dictators, especially in Central Africa, Eastern Africa, than in West Africa, Southern Africa, and North Africa, you know, to be honest with you, rolled into one. You could also talk about, for example, the Zambian president, Edgar Lungo. 
we were there in August, we saw it all. I'm afraid that uh, even a man like uh, uh, John Pombe Magufuli, who initially looked like uh, he was a new, uh, a new uh, kind of like uh, uh, bleed of African leadership, uh, it, it seems to me that uh, he, seeming, he seems to be crossing the line. Even though earlier today, I saw him in fact in a very beautiful picture with uh, the man who tried to become the president, uh, you know, riding, uh, you know, or with Chadema. Uh, I'm talking about uh, uh, Mr. Ruasa, Edward Ruasa. They had a very beautiful picture. I don't know whether you saw it in the East African. Uh, what are you talking about uh, tomorrow on uh, Straight Talk Africa? Tomorrow, it's very interesting, uh, a little bit different, but we're talking about uh, an incredible lady born in Ethiopia uh, to a senior military officer. Her name is uh, Yaharawak Gashau. Uh, I used to see her on billboards on Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles when I was at UCLA. Yeah. She used to be one of the greatest, one of the most uh, 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 adored uh, models coming out of the African continent and working internationally. She first became a model in Paris and then eventually moved to New York and uh, she now lives in um, Dallas in the state of Texas. She is a Pan-Africanist. She is an activist. Uh, she's all sorts of things rolled into one. I can't wait sincerely to have one-on-one -on -one with Yeharawak Gashau. Well, Ishaka, we seem to be running out of time. Uh, thank you again uh, for being a great uh, guest. Uh, I look forward to hosting you on another edition of uh, Shaka Extra Time next week. And to you all our viewers, uh, we say thank you. And uh, keep uh, bringing those uh, comments. Uh, remember, Shaka Extra Time is a place where you get to talk to Shaka himself. Once again, so long uh, from Washington.